Okay, so this video is going to be a little bit different. Um, I just want to give more insight into like what enterprise software development kind of looks like. And I'm going to walk you through how like a system and a team of like 10 developers all collaborate together, basically code, integrate, build, test, and deploy their applications and like the environments that what they might look like. Okay, so again, the scope of what I'm going to be saying is like a team of 10 developers because that's kind of what I have most experience with. But again, there's, there are teams and projects that have like a lot more developers than that. And there's a lot of projects that have one or two developers. So really, I want to kind of give you insight into like what I've typically seen in the industry. So the first thing I want to do is we have developers. Okay, so I'm just going to make a bunch of different developers. All right, so we got like nine developers over there. That's probably good enough. And then also... Every team, depending if you're using Agile, you might have like a Scrum Master. So I'll say like a Scrum Master here. And then you might also have like a project manager. Um, and then, you know, some teams will have a designer or one or two UX designers. Our team actually has a UX UI. I think we have like two members. Okay, so this is like your core team. And then typically there's a client. And this could be one or could be multiple people. But your job is to basically build software for this client, right? The client has requests, they have things that they need built, and those clients typically, what I've seen is that they use, the client has to basically be the buffer between your users. And typically what you're doing is you are trying to satisfy a customer or a client. Sometimes you might have multiple of these people, sometimes you have one person who's like kind of leading the project, and you're trying to basically daily have stand-ups and kind of demo your work to that client and get feedback from the client. And at the same time, the client is the one with the vision of what they want built. So they're going to kind of give you some requirements and tell you, hey, I need, you know, stuff to do this and that. Now, a lot of things that I've read about is that like your dev team here should be kind of like directly integrating and talking to users. But most of the time, there's like this middle man, the client, who's basically doing that talking for you, right? From what I've seen, okay, every team is different, okay. So like the users will basically use the system. The client is going to give you, you know, stories and tasks that you have to work on and whatnot. And then your team is supposed to take down the needs of the clients and needs of the users, find the best solution and implement that. Now there's a little bit more nuance to this. Like tec technically, the UI UX people would be like, you know, doing user research, talking to users, you know, direct talking directly to the clients. The devs would be demoing to users and clients. The project manager is basically working directly with the client and the devs and the UX, like make sure everything is going smoothly, that we're hitting deliverables on time, that the roadmap is good. And then the scrum master, if you're doing agile, is just trying to make sure that all the meetings you do are trying to follow like the, you know, the scrum guides. So that's kind of like the overall, like what I've seen. Feel free to leave a comment if you've seen some other but that's generally what happens, right? Whether you have one or nine devs, like you're going to be talking to someone who's basically dictating what you got to build, whether that's your boss, um, whether that's your client, if you're working as like a consultant. All right. So ultimately the goal is these clients and these users are going to ask you to do something. So like if I were to go ahead and right, they're going to, they're going to write down some things that they want and you got to figure out how to basically ship stuff to them so that your users can actually interact with this stuff. Okay. Again, like I said, this is going to be all over the place, so don't judge me too hard about my lack of planning. So your goal as a developer is ship features. So your users will use the feature that you're shipping. So your clients and your users basically kind of dictate what you're building. Your dev team and your UI UXers and everything to get together and try to ship these features to production. Your users will use them and you will continue this feedback loop over and over again until you get a well-polished system and you kind of keep on going back and forth of like making new features, improving old features, fixing bugs and stuff like that. Okay, so that's like the, the whole project management life cycle kind of, I'm glossing over the terms. Now the next step is how do we take this requirement here and how do we convert it into a deployable package? Because there is a lot that goes on under the hood with how this works. So typically, I'm gonna move down here you have some type of version control, right? So I'm going to go ahead and just put like git. And the developers are going to get a story or a task or whatever you want to call it. So what we kind of tried to do on our team is we have the devs basically break off into smaller groups. We do a lot of ensemble programming or pair programming or mob programming, whatever you want to call it, where we'll grab like two or three developers and we'll try to work on a story. And as we're working on the story, what we do 
is we will check out a feature branch. Okay, so if you're familiar with Git, this is a version control software. More specifically, we use GitHub, but using Git, you can basically have your master branch, or I guess we call it main these days. The main branch is basically what should have your production code, right? But what we do is we'll check off a feature from main onto a, we'll call a feature branch, I guess, feature branch. And this group of developers will basically continuously every day, they will add features, they will push that feature branch, they will try to test out that code. And then once they feel like that code is good, they will create something called a pull request. Okay, let's go ahead and do a pull request to try to get that feature merged into main. So at this point, you have three devs who have basically worked every day together. We're in a Zoom, we're pairing together, we're sharing screens, we're writing the code, trying to implement test cases, make sure everything works. And then we make a pull request. And at this point, other members of the team will go and try to review that pull request. You want to try to do as much knowledge sharing as possible. So the more people you have kind of understanding what's changing the system and how the code is changing, the better it is, right? Because, you know, people leave companies, people come and go. So the more knowledge that you share amongst all your developers, the better your team health is going to be. But anyway, we have uh, constraints where like we try to get like one or two devs to review this pull request. And once it's good, we merge it in the main. And that kicks off a chain reaction in the CI CD pipeline. Uh, we use GitHub Actions at our work, but people use Circle CI, people might use Jenkins. But basically this kicks off a trigger. I can go like this and I'll say like, let's just say GitHub Actions where we basically build, test, and then we deploy code, okay? And that is basically the, the whole like deliverable, right? This thing, once it's built and everything's tested and deployed, okay, that's where we get this little shippable feature. That makes sense? So we work on the work, we merge it in the main, that kicks off a thing to basically build everything, test it, deploy it, and that gets into the hands of users where they can play around with it. This is if you're doing like trunk-based development off of main, but often with enterprise software, you can't just start merging features into main unless you have a very, very, very robust testing suite. Often most teams I've seen, you wanna have QA engineers kind of verify stuff. You wanna have the product manager be able to click through a test environment or a QA environment to make sure everything's good. And the way that you can achieve that is by using different branches. So in our case, we have various branches. We have like a test branch, we have like a dev branch, now, instead of just checking off a main every time, you can check off of a dev branch, okay? And this dev branch, basically, you're gonna work off of the dev branch, you'll do some features, and then you are going to do a pull request to your dev branch when everything is good, like that, okay? And the dev branch is mainly for developers, right? It's a, it's a environment and a branch that basically has your latest development code and you want developers to basically integrate their features together as much as possible. Okay, every day you guys should be pushing different changes of the story that you're working into some type of centralized location. Like integrate as often as possible is the idea. Okay, so you might say, okay, well, you have this dev branch. What is the, what is the point of this? Okay, again, you have this entire workflow with GitHub Actions or whatever CI CD pipeline where you have a build, deploy, and test step when code is merged into dev, and what this does is this is actually going to deploy out an entire environment. So in our case, we use AWS for everything, but inside of AWS, when this thing is deploying, it's gonna be running a bunch of different scripts. We use Terraform as our infrastructure as code tool, but there's like AWS CDK, there's like the serverless framework. You can just do a bunch of AWS CLI commands if you want. Um, but in our project, everything is automated. So when it gets this deploy step, it basically runs one command and that goes into Amazon and it starts spinning up tons of different services, right? We get like serverless lambdas, like we'll get lambdas spun up. We get open search, open search clusters spun up, um, like Dynamo, CloudFront for the CDN. I probably could use real icons for this instead of just boxes, but hopefully you get the idea. Okay, so again, like the purpose of this is that we have a dev environment and now all these developers can basically try to play around with. They can click through. This is a live deployed environment with fake data. This doesn't have like real production data, but it's everything is fully deployed and integrated together. 
so that you're confident that when developers are working on stuff together, that like nothing is breaking. Okay, because when you start getting to like cloud deployments, everything might work locally on your machine, but the moment you start deploying stuff, if you have like one configuration that's off, it just starts breaking. Okay, so we do this daily. You integrate and push stuff to dev daily. You're deploying and updating your infrastructure on a dev environment. So I'll say AWS dev. And once everything is good, at some point, you decide I'm going to cut a release, right? So you're basically going to take your branch and you're going to make a pull request, merge your changes to a higher tier environment. Now, in our case, you'd merge it to like test or QA or staging. A lot of people say like staging. Um, it doesn't really matter. Like this convention is a little bit different for every team. But basically, once you have like a, a nice set of features that you want to get in front of users, you cut a release. You make a pull request, just like we did before. People might review it, and then you get that merge into a higher environment. Now, what happens when you merge all of these recent dev changes into another environment? Well, it kicks off yet again another GitHub action pipeline, which is going to spin up an entire environment. I'll put staging. It's probably too small to read, but now we've got a staging environment. So. We have basically the exact same infrastructure completely replicated in a higher tier environment. And the main difference between this environment and the other environment is that staging, you may have pre-production data, pre-prod data, right? So this might have um, more realistic data sets. Okay, so if dev was just like, you know, just enough to test to make sure stuff is working, you can click through. This has a bunch more data, so you're verifying against like a larger data set. But basically, when you deploy these two environments, you can actually ask your clients or your users, or you have like a, a set of test users to go and just poke around in this environment, play with the feature, get some feedback. The, the best way is just pull them to a Zoom and like show them the feature you're working on and get feedback then. Let them control your screen and click around with the feature. But depending on the way your team works, you might not have access to users that easily. So the next best step is you give them access to like a deployed environment where they can go and play around with the test user. Mm -hmm. Now, some other things you can do on your staging environment is that you might have a bunch of like load tests. Okay, You might want to run a bunch of load tests on this real production like data to make sure that, hey, when everything is deployed and we get a lot of traffic, does this stuff actually hold up? Okay, so you might do some load tests, you might do some like smoke tests, I'll say load tests. And sometimes this will happen inside of the deployment pipeline. So like you'll do a build, test, deploy, and then you'll do smoke tests and load tests all in an automated fashion, right? And at that point, you'll look at staging, you know, your product owner, your clients, or your users will come in, they'll start playing around with features. And if everything is good, you'll do this process again to basically get those features merged to like a main branch. You guys super confused yet? Which again, when that pull request is finally merged in, that's gonna kick off a deploy. And basically you're gonna have another identical environment that has all the same resources that you had in staging and dev, and that's gonna get updated and deployed. And your users are going to actually use that deployed environment over here. So this is one of the main benefits of like basically using something like Terraform or infrastructure as code, because all of these resources, like you could have hundreds of these resources. You could have like SQS queues, SNS topics, um, SES configurations. You never want your developers actually going into your AWS dashboard and like clicking things by hand, because you can see how quickly that if you were to go and manually update something here, you're going to forget to deploy it to prod, right? So you want to use infrastructure as code tools so that when you do a deployment, it basically just takes a snapshot of the current configuration of your environments and just deploys it out to whatever environment you're trying to go to. And another beauty of infrastructure as code is that you can spin up as many environments as you want, right? So we have actually a bunch of different experimental environments where I work, where developers can go and you know push their changes to some experimental branch just to verify that when stuff is integrated together, everything works fine. So that's kind of the flow that I have seen um, during my career, we've done this a lot. It works pretty well. But this, again, this is like a smaller scale project, right? This is like 10 developers. Now, what happens is when you get into a larger team and a larger project, let's say you have 50 developers, this whole process is literally duplicated 
for different teams. So you might be doing this, like every team might have their own set of clients, their own users, their own project that they're working on. And the only difference is, and they might all have their own unique way of basically getting their code deployed out. Some teams might be more efficient than others. And when you're at an enterprise setting, you know, there's higher up managers that are kind of like overseeing all these different teams and trying to like coordinate and get all this stuff working together because these prod environments here, I know it's super small to see, but these things are all integrated together in different ways, right? You might have microservices, you might have different environments needing to access data from different databases and stuff like that. So you have these three different prod environments in this example, and you have managers on top trying to figure out, okay, how is this team going to be able to deploy a change and hopefully allow this team to be successful and stuff like that. And it just keeps scaling up and up. Like the bigger the project and corporation that you're at, the more these things just keep breaking out into you know, more teams and more stuff. It gets crazy, right? It gets crazy. So depending on when your project, you might just be on like a one man team and you just push the main every single, every single day. And then that kicks off a first cell deployment. And then your users see that when you get to an enterprise setting, it, it doesn't work as beautifully as that. It's not as simple as that. Let me undo most of that stuff. Um, I'm going to go back to like the basic view here where we have one, one team. And again, there's like nuances to all this, like this whole this whole cutter release from dev to staging to main, it has issues as well because you can have unfinished work getting all the way up to production and you can apply things like feature flags um, and wrap code to make sure that code never runs in production until a certain flag is turned on, right? You might have like a database over here, right? You might have like a feature flag database over here where you have like, um, you know, your users or your clients can go and update different Booleans and when they update a certain feature flag, it turns a feature on for all the users. That's one scenario you can do to basically allow you to kind of do this workflow. A lot of teams just work directly off of main. And if you're CI CD pipeline and you have tons of tests, you have a lot of confidence that like when your, your builds pass, you know that everything will be good. So there's two other things I kind of want to want to hit on, right? There's how do you handle bugs and Actually, zooming in a little bit, this is actually more complicated because if you were to look at the infrastructure of your deployments, of your prod environment, often in enterprise, you have requirements saying that you need to have like five nines uptime, right? So you can only be down for like an hour out of the whole year. You can only be down for like 30 minutes out of the whole year. Some projects have higher requirements and depending on the requirements, you may have to set up basically a multi-region deployment where you have one entire infrastructure set up in East Coast of AWS. So like we'll say this is east and then you might have another infrastructure set up in the west coast so that if for whatever reason the east coast goes down which it does once in a while sometimes all your users are basically redirected to the west coast that's called like a active passive i believe um setup but there's also active active where you have east coast users always hitting the east coast and west coast users always hitting the west coast so they have the lowest latency and you'll have like your data replicated between your databases in between these things. And if you have like more different services, you know, there's like replication going on between those. Just so that if whatever reason, if something were to go down, there is ways for your system to be resilient and not completely fall over for different users, right? So for example, if let's say open search inside this box were to go down, right? All the users on the East Coast, your whole system will basically start failing, right? So you have to have ways internally to basically say, okay, well, the East Elasticsearch is down. Let's just route to the West Coast and grab that. And of course, there's always like rules with like data and like where can data live? Are you allowed to pass data around? A lot of country laws like prevent you from having user data sent over to various regions. So if you're working on an enterprise setting and you have a bunch of user data, if you were to try to replicate your data to like Europe or vice versa, if you were to try to replicate from Europe to, to US East 1, you could get in a lot of trouble. A lot of times we hear about like edge computing and multi-region and stuff like that. It's not as simple as just flipping a switch because there are laws that you have to be in place to make sure that user data is not replicated. So I just wanted to touch on that because even inside these little boxes, it gets way more complicated with how everything is set up and interacting with each other on AWS with multi-region. Okay, and then the second thing I want to talk about, I don't know if I have more stuff I want to talk about. The second thing is how do you handle bugs? Okay, when a user is kind of working on a feature, let's say you just deployed a feature, and you start getting a ton of errors, okay? How do you even know that there's errors? Well, the first line of defense is the user will contact you and say, hey, you know, I'm getting, I'm getting tons of errors and you'll get a bunch of like 
incident reports from your client or from your user saying, hey, there's like an issue with this new feature we deployed. Your first line of defense if you're using feature flags is you just go into this database and you turn the feature off. Just turn it off so that no one is using that feature. Second line of defense is you could do a rollback deployment. So all the changes you just made to this environment, find a way to roll it back. And sometimes it's usually just a matter of like rolling back an individual change here. Like maybe you just change some API code. So all you need to do is roll back your Lambda from one version to the previous version. But as far as like the, the code for fixing the bug, sometimes you can't roll back. Sometimes you can't just turn the feature flag off. You have to do something called like a hot fix, right? So what we do or what I've seen done in the industry is instead of doing this whole flow where you work off dev, staging, and main, you could potentially just check off a branch directly off a of main. Okay, so like you'll have like a set of developers basically check off a branch here. They'll do their quick fix and then they will try to get that redeployed out to main as fast as possible. And depending on how risk adverse your team is, maybe you'll do it to staging, maybe you'll do it to some pre prod environment first that has to, you know, get checked off by some higher ups to say, okay, we're good to go. And then you do that whole process again. But now that you've put code inside of these branches and it doesn't exist in this branch, what you have to do now is you have to back merge your changes from main all the way down to your dev environment or back merge from staging to your dev environment so that this is up to date with the latest changes that was just hot fixed on main. Okay. And again, this is, it just gets complicated, right? Enterprise development gets uh, complicated, which is why like a lot of the stuff I do on my channel, I don't want to get into this stuff. I just want to be able to push the main, have it build, have it deploy, and my users can use it right then and there. And I would say like smaller teams and startups probably don't do all that complexity. They probably just, you know, work directly off a of main and then they get that auto built through, I don't know, or sell or something like that. That gets deployed out if you're using Next. And that's also one of the beauties of using something like Next.js and Vercel is that if you can avoid deferring all this complexity, do so, and then only start adding in complexity as you find it needed. Unless you have like ex explicit requirements that you have to do all this stuff and it actually improves your team and your process and your quality, um, then I would say avoid it. Like if you ever watch Theo, he talks about basically, instead of doing all the work I just described, just get good at fixing bugs, right? When you deploy a new feature, if a user says that something's broken, get good at deploying a fix within 30 minutes, which basically allows you to avoid all that complexity. It's not necessarily unnecessary complexity. It's, it's complexity for a particular reason. If you're working on a high stakes system, you can't risk shipping a bug. If you ship a bug and you break, I don't know, some major piece of functionality for millions of users, that's no good, right? That's when you start having all these other like workflows come in because you're trying to avoid breaking production as much as possible. You start adding tons of unit tests, tons of integration tests, tons of end-to-end -end tests. You start doing these multi-tier environments because you want to make sure that when you go live with this new change, it doesn't just start blowing up for everybody because that could be very, very bad for your users. Maybe you're working on actually like healthcare systems or something. And if you have three days of downtime because you broke uh, people's insurance or you, you know, you broke some type of software that's used for monitoring people's health, that could have huge impacts on people's lives, right? So again, just keep in mind that whatever your project you're working on, if you're working on a project that does something basic like this, you're either not that high risk of a project or you guys just don't care and you guys can fix bugs really fast when they come. Anyway, I've been talking for like 30 something minutes, so I'm going to wrap this up. I hope you guys enjoyed this random video, um, sporadic video, but I think it was important to share because most people that you watch on YouTube and read on Twitter, I feel like they're all just startup companies or indie hackers, and you don't really get good insight as to like how the large scale enterprise systems actually work under the hood. Cool. Have a good day. Happy coding.